Well, welcome to our briefing today on nuclear energy. This is part of a series that a, a number of geoscience organizations have put together on energy from the earth. My name's John Price. I'm a consulting geologist whose careers included some work in uranium in situ mining, and I served as the state geologist of Nevada for 24 years. Uh, our speakers today uh, are experts in the topics that we're going to focus on for the briefing. Uh, one is on adequacy of resources, another one on geological hazards, and another on waste management. Our first speaker is going to be Susan Hall, Dr. Susan Hall. She's a geologist and the uranium resource expert with the U.S. Geological Survey in Denver. Uh, she chairs the International Atomic Energy Agency's uranium group and worked in the private sector before joining the USGS in, in the areas of mineral exploration and resource modeling. Uh, so Susan's going to talk to us today about uh, uranium resources. Thanks, um, and thanks for coming today. I'll speak with you a bit about uh, world uranium resources supply and demand. Um, I'm running through uranium supply fundamentals, current supply demand, and projections of supply and demand, major challenges uh, to uranium production, and then a bit about undiscovered resources, unconventional resources, which may pot be potential future supplies. Um, uranium supply is either described as primary, that would be mined uranium, uh, and is tabulated as reasonably assured resources or more speculative potential undiscovered resources, or secondary supplies um, that are stocks and inventories of previously mined uranium available in various forms. There are 434 uh, operable reactors worldwide, 100 in the U.S., providing about 11 percent of electricity and 19 percent of electricity in the United States. 71 reactors are under construction, uh, 173 planned mostly in China, Russia, and in India. In 2012, world demand was 176 million pounds of uranium to fuel these reactors, uh, but production was 151 million pounds. Um, most of that is made, well, that's made up of, uh, the difference is made up of secondary supplies of, of uranium. Uh, the U.S. requirements are 50 million pounds, 4 million of which are pr produced domestically. A number of um, global supply demand scenarios are published. This one is uh, from the World Nuclear Association, their projections to 2030. Um, without going into greater detail, uh, the scenario on the left, the solid bars are supply, that would be uh, developing mines that are coming online in a timely fashion, and the lines are demand, uh, and in the lower and mid-case scenarios, supply and demand, uh, or supply satisfies demand. However, in a less optimistic scenario, as shown on the right, mines are delayed um, and uh, demand outpaces supply. Currently, world uranium production is dominated by Kazakhstan with uh, important production from Canada and Australia as well, and Niger and Namibia. In 2012, about 75% of uh, uranium requirements were satisfied by primary supply and 25% by secondary. Looking into the near future, large, reasonably assured resources are published for Australia. It's the red bar on the bottom. Um, U.S. is second, actually, in RAR, but a lot of our resources are in higher cost, currently sub-economic uh, categories. Some of the vulnerabilities to supply include um, the reliance of, of production on some large mines worldwide. T over the top 10 mine, uranium mines in the world produced over half of world supply. Each one of these mines is vulnerable to production interruptions, <clears throat> and I can go down the list and tell you interruptions that have uh, stopped uh, production in the past. Um, so this, this could have a strong impact on the uranium market. As well, we rely on reasonably assured resources, but how accessible they are has, is not quantified. Uh, for instance, the two largest deposits in the U.S., the Coles Hill, Virginia, and Mount Taylor, New Mexico deposits, are not easily accessible. Accessibility is a uh, glow, growing global concern as well. The IAEA Red Book, which is um, the Bible of uh, uranium resources, is considering a UN classification system that's in development that adds a socioeconomic uh, viability measurement on top of 
economic and geologic certitude as more traditional. There are long lag times from discovery to production because you know uh, our, these resources exist in the ground. There may be 15 to 20 years in climbing before these resources are brought to the market. Uh, and there's increasing cost to discover and extract uranium as well. With time. Uh, over the past three years, lower uranium prices have challenged uh, companies' ability to raise money and develop projects. So there's a number of delays that have been uh, reported worldwide. And a um, number of mines on standby, including all the conventional mines in the U.S. Long-term, um, undiscovered resources are a measure of potential supply. The U.S. has a very large undiscovered uh, resource that is re has been reported in the past, a large uh, line on the lower end of this uh, graph. And in the more speculative category, U.S. also has a large published resource. However, these resources were calculated in the, as part of the National Uranium Resource Evaluation Program that ended in the 1980s and we can no longer find the supporting uh, documentation, so we had to pull these resources from international reporting. U.S. Energy Information Administration tabulates reserves. Most of those are in the western U.S., and about 10 years of U.S. supply is tabulated by EIA at 2013 rates of demand. <clears throat> and indeed, most uranium mining, or all uranium mining, is in western states, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Texas. USGS started reassessing domestic undiscovered uranium resources after uh, we determined that we could no longer um, support the published numbers. We we're prioritizing certain geologic uh, environments that are high priority, that have never been assessed in the United States um, in support of land use and energy policy. So one of the first regions uh, or types of deposits we're looking at are metasomatic shear zone deposits. The large Coles Hill deposit in Virginia is the type deposit. Um, we're doing a genetic study of Coles Hill this year. When we better understand the genesis of this deposit, we'll expand this uh, into an undiscovered resource assessment for the U.S. Calcrete uranium, another really important um, resource type worldwide, large deposits in Australia and in Namibia. It's, it appears that the geologic factors that are responsible for forming these deposits, geologic and climate factors, exist in the U.S., but none have yet been identified. So we're studying the, uh, uh, whether or not these deposits uh, occur, and if they do, we'll assess, again, do an undiscovered resource assessment for this type. Unconformity deposits, uh, all the production from Canada right now is coming from unconformity type deposits. That's never been assessed. These deposits have never been evaluated in the United States. Um, an intriguing uh, potential future source of uranium is from uh, as a byproduct of phosphate fertilizer production. Phosphate is mined for fertilizer in the U.S. and is naturally high in uranium, uh, but the uranium is currently now, not now recovered. There are some um, techniques of recovery that are in the pilot testing stage, and we're closely following those to see if this is uh, a viable resource that we will then assess. Sandstone-hosted deposits contain the largest, largest resource in the U.S. They were well evaluated under the National Uranium Resource Evaluation Program, um, and our understandings have not grown substantially since, since then of the geologic controls. However, we're assessing the Gulf Coast Uranium Province to see if methodologies of uh, estimating undiscovered resources um, are still viable or if that we've made enough advances we need to reassess this type of resource. Another uh, potential uranium supply would be uranium from seawater. Um, the Japanese have been uh, the forerunners in researching this type of um, uh, uranium source, although the Department of Energy began funding research in 2011. Uh, the largest hurdle that, to overcome here, first hurdle, is the economics. It's not even close to economic to extract uh, at the present time. And thorium is uh, discussed as an alternative to nuclear fuels. There are no commercial reactors, thorium reactors, uh, currently operating worldwide. Um, but it's estimated that in any build-out scenarios for the U.S., adequate thorium could be derived from as a byproduct of mining rare earth element deposits. Our next speaker is Dr. Annie Kammerer. Annie's a principal seismologist with the uh, Bechtel Corporation in San Francisco. Before joining Bechtel, uh, she coordinated the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's seismic research program 
and help to develop the post-Fukushima response and reevaluation guidance. She's worked internationally on projects related to earthquake uh, engineering, geotechnical aspects, structural dynamics, seismology, and risk assessment. And so Annie's going to tell us about the geological hazards, particularly uh, earthquake hazards with regard to nuclear power plants. So thank you very much for being here and having me uh, talk about how earth science supports seismic safety of U.S. nuclear plants. Um, by the way, I just left the NRC for Bechtel, so I, I'll say we a lot, and by that I mean the NRC. Um, so the U.S. Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission, the NRC, uses a risk-informed regulatory framework, and assessing seismic risk requires understanding and quantifying seismic hazards, and also understanding and quantifying plant seismic capacity. Because of this uh, regulatory framework, Earth science data has a direct impact on nuclear safety by allowing the nuclear industry, the operators, and the NRC to better quantify natural hazards, uh, the plants must be able to withstand along with their associated uncertainties of hazard. So risk generally has two parts. It has the seismic load or the hazard, which we quantify as the likelihood of the probability of some shaking level. And that's coupled with uh, the possibility of some, the probability of something bad happened at the plants uh, under that shaking level. So it's both the hazard as well as the capacity of the plant to address the hazard that uh, runs into the risk calculation. The NRC has been looking at seismic hazards for a very long time. In 1971, the NRC established uh, what we call GDC-2, which requires that plants be designed to withstand natural phenomena, including seismic and flooding, with the consideration of data uncertainty. Shortly thereafter, they produced uh, detailed criteria to evaluate the suitability of proposed plant sites, as well as the su suitability of the plant seismic design basis, so the, the <coughs> shaking level to which the plant is uh, designed. This led very early on to a system of site investigation um, with increasing level of effort close to the site. Um, however, any seismic sources, any seismic information need, that may impact the site needed to be incorporated. This framework is generally still in place and still serves the community well. Uh, quite a few things happened, but in 1996 the NRC issued um, an update, a reorganization, which completes the current legal basis for the seismic design. They define safe shutdown, earthquake, ground motion, so it's a, it's a regulatory uh, design basis. And they specified that nuclear power plants must be designed so that if this shaking level occurs, certain structure systems and components remain functional and within the applicable engineering limits. Also in addition of an explicit requirement to consider uncertainty. So that's, that's the, uh, the current code uh, of federal regulations. There's also guidance. And in 1997, the commission, the five-member commission, issued a directive to move towards more risk-informed policies that have been promulgated today. In 2007, the NRC issued new regulatory guidance which describes the current hazard assessment approach. Uh, and this is designed to work with current engineering guidance um, to meet the NRC's risk objectives. This uses a 10,000 to 100,000 year ground motion level for the design ground motions, which is indeed a very rare uh, ground motion for design. And this requires significant earth science um, needs are uh, come about because of this need to quantify these rare events appropriately. The risk targets that this work toward include the frequency of damage of individual safety-related elements, core damage frequency, which looks at how all of these are strung into systems, and also something called LURF, or large early release frequency, which also looks at containment. So, sort of in summary, the current U.S. risk-informed regulatory approach to seismic safety provides a very rational basis for decision making that is targeted on risk factors that matter, predominantly the possibility of core damage and the possibility of release to the atmosphere. But this assessment of risk relies directly on the quantification of seismic hazard, and that in turn relies on sufficient and robust earth science information, and that's from the broader technical community. The NRC does a lot of work, the industry does a lot of work, but they rely heavily on information from the USGS, 
from universities, from research institutions, from the broader technical community, and that community needs to be supported to support seismic safety of nuclear plants. Um, so briefly, the way that we assess hazard is something called a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, or PSHA. The objective is to determine the best estimate, as well as uncertainty estimate, of ground motion levels at a particular location, so a particular site, over time periods of interest, so the 10,000 year, the 100,000 year, the million year ground motion. PSHA, PSHA considers ground motion from all possible earthquakes from all sources that may impact a site, and it accounts for the likelihood of each of those individual earthquakes in the analysis. This approach can be used for any natural hazard. Uh, it's more, most advanced in seismic, and that's what I'm talking about, but there's a lot of movement to, for flooding to move into this framework as well and to use the existing tools. A PSHA model is developed uh, using NRC guidance, uh, which incorporate evaluation integration of all available models and methods. And I think it's important to understand that when we look at um, the models that are out there for seismicity, we don't look at the, the model we like the boat most or that's best. We look at all alternate technical defensible interpretations and put them in logic trees. And you also account for natural randomness and variability in these models. There's a few parts to it. The first element that one needs to do is look at source geometry. Where are the sources located? And to find how big are they? Uh, for each of these sources, one needs to assess earthquake recurrence. How big, uh, what kind of magnitudes do they have and how likely are those magnitudes? Those together are, are called a seismic source characterization. You then need ground motion characterization, which says for a particular earthquake at this location, what is the ground motion at my particular site? And so these together are used to give you the probability of a ground motion exceedance. These are all of the elements that play in. And there's a number of different types of earth science that, that uh, come into this. Seismicity is often considered. Where do earthquakes occur? Where have they been recorded? And geology and tectonics. But there are also um, efforts to look at the deeper magnetics, gravity. Um, geodetics or GPS tells us how the plates are moving relative to each other, how energy is building. There's a whole new field of paleoseismic. Uh, work, which looks at those scars left on the landscape. Things like crustal stress, crustal geophysics, site characteristics, all of these together feed into these very comprehensive models. Recently, uh, the NRC, along with the Department of Energy and EPRI, the uh, industry group, with support with, by the USGS, published um, or published one model and is in the process of developing a second. The first is uh, the Central Eastern U.S. Seismic Source Characterization for Nuclear Facilities. So it's all of the major sources east of the Rockies. The ground motion study that's in progress will then say for, for where the location of these earthquakes, what does that mean to the nuclear, um, the nuclear plant or whatever facility that you're looking at. These were major cooperative studies, and I think this is, these were examples of when government works best. Um, as, you, as I mentioned, those were published in 12, which means they were well underway by the time that Fukushima, Fukushima happened. And this was the anniversary. It had a major impact on the thinking and regulation of nuclear plants globally. Um, in this case, the result was essentially not the seismic shaking, but was the flooding of the site, which took out um, some of the ener on-site energy options. Um, and so this was really a failure, a regulatory failure, and a failure to assess hazard properly. Shortly after Fukushima, the NRC published um, a, a lessons learned and a recommendations report, which is an excellent report, and I, I recommend that anyone who hasn't read, read it does so. It provides lots of good information. From that, then, the NRC started a, uh, a study, a reevaluation of hazard and risk, which has been ongoing um, for, the, for the last period of time. The, the plants which sit within the study zone for that CEUS model that came out their risk assessments, excuse me, their hazard assessments are due this month. And so you'll start seeing some of the results of the reevaluation of hazard at U.S. sites this month. For the Western plants, they have an additional 18 months because they're having to do very intensive site specific studies. So for any sites for which the new assessment, the 10,000 year assessment of hazard is higher than the initial design basis, um, 
they will have to go forth and then do a risk assessment study. And from that, one can determine whether plant modifications need to be made. One thing, though, I'd like to point out is that the operating reactors were designed using a very different approach. It's what was called a scenario or deterministic earthquake was used. There was not an assessment of likelihood of the scenario earthquake or the resulting ground motions. And these were coupled in their day with extremely conservative engineering. There's a lot of margin in the operating plants. So the new assessments will be a little bit apples to oranges in terms of the hazard assessment, and the, the risk results are really the important element. Thank you very much. Thanks, Annie. Our next speaker is Dr. Jean Barr. Jean is a professor in the Department of Geoscience at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, her research focuses on the movement of groundwater and its d dissolved elements. Uh, she served on the National Research Council's Board on Radioactive Waste Management and is well versed in the issues regarding waste from reactors. Jean will talk to us about the geological aspects of nuclear waste. Okay, well it's a pleasure to be here today to participate in this briefing series. I want to say at the outset that um, while I'm a member of a number of the organizations that are sponsoring this briefing, and I also wear a couple of hats in my day job, including being a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I'm here today as an individual geoscientist and not as a representative of any organization or institution or agency. And my role in this briefing is to discuss the importance of geology, and by that I actually mean the broader field of the geosciences, in dealing with the byproducts of nuclear energy, namely um, radioactive waste and spent nuclear fuel. So what's geology got to do with it? The short answer to that, um, uh, probably not surprised, is a lot. The main disposal option that's being considered in the US and throughout the world um, by countries that use nuclear power is to bury the radioactive waste um, and spent fuel deep beneath the land surface in what we call mined geologic repositories. And it's the properties of the rocks um, and geologic processes that determine to a great extent whether we're, we actually have the feasibility to isolate and contain these hazardous materials for very long periods of time. Some of them remain hazardous for a million years or more. And it's also the properties of geologic materials and geologic processes um, that determine um, how resilient a waste repository is going to be to natural and human disturbances. And finally, um, a number of geologic processes and properties um, play a role in the feasibility and costs of actually constructing a repository and operating it um, at the time that wastes are being put into it. So what I want to do for the remainder of my presentation is to highlight a few aspects related to each of these three um, roles of, of geology. Um, so in terms of isolation and containment, the first thing that it's important to recognize is that the primary way that radionuclides might make their way from deep burial in a repository to the land surface or near surface where humans might be um, impacted by them is via the movement of subsurface water, or what I call groundwater. It's water held in the rocks. And um, the chemical properties of the water that are in the rocks near the repository um, are important to determining the rates at which the waste canisters um, might corrode, the, the rate at which the waste itself might dissolve, and ultimately how much of those radionuclides will make their way into the water that's held in those rocks. Um, the chemical properties of the rocks themselves, or the minerals that make up the rocks, are also very important in determining whether the radionuclides are going to stay dissolved in the water and hence can move with the water, whether they will stick to the mineral surfaces and become immobilized, or whether they might actually hitch a ride by sticking to mobile microscopic particles called colloids that are actually in the water phase. So the chemical properties, both the water and the rocks, are, are critical. Um, another set of properties that are near and dear to my heart as a hydrogeologist are the hydrologic properties, the, pro the water-bearing properties of geologic materials. And the first question that we ask is, how much water is there in those rocks? And we quantify that um, by measuring something that we call the porosity. And that's basically how much water is held in a, in a given volume of rock, of rock. And for the most part, the pore space, these voids, are microscopic. This is a picture of a, what we call a thin section, basically a thin slice of sandstone, and the little grains of sand in there are maybe a millimeter across. The blue pores around them are even smaller. Um, so we're not talking about rivers, we're talking about microscopic um, pores. 
there are some kinds of rocks, like crystal and granite, um, where there's almost no space between the crystals and the rocks. But those types of rocks can have larger pores in the, terms, in the form of fractures and macro pores. The second question we can ask about the water bearing properties is how fast will water flow through rock or sediment? And we quantify that by the property that we call permeability. And this figure is an illustration just comparing in sort of relative senses how quickly water might flow through four different materials, gravel, sand, silt, and clay. And in general, water is going to flow more quickly through materials that have more pores and also ones that have larger pores. So the larger the pores, the easier it is for the water to flow. If we look at the universe of geologic materials, um, both rocks and sediments, and we plot their permeability on a figure like this, and what we see is that the range of that spans 12 orders of magnitude, goes from 10 to the minus 8th to about 10,000. And, and I don't have a very good feeling for what 12 orders of magnitude is, um, but it actually turns out to be about the difference between the width of a human hair and the diameter of the Earth. So this is a highly variable property, very difficult to constrain. The U.S. and all of the um, other countries that are trying to cite geologic repositories are looking at um, rocks that are on the low end of the permeability spectrum. But even if we look at a particular rock type, for example, shale, we'll see that there's a thousand-fold possible range in permeability for that relatively well-characterized material. And that would, could translate into a thousand-fold difference in predicted travel times of water from a repository to the surface, say 100 years on one end and 100,000 years on another. Um, so pinning those, num those numbers down is really important. Radioactive waste and spent nuclear fuel are going to continue to give off heat um, after they're buried, and particularly in the first few hundred years when the radionuclides with short half-lives are decaying. And heat can have an interesting effect on the rocks. It can affect um, the mechanical properties. It can have an effect on the waste itself. So it becomes very critical to figure out, is that waste going to accumulate in the, um, in the repository itself, or is it going to dissipate through the rocks? And we measure that property of heat dissipation by the thermal conductivity. Now, the thermal conductivity, fortunately, is not nearly as variable or as uncertain as permeability to water, but it can still have significant variations. And for example, heat will move about twice as fast through salt as it will through granite. And one of the more um, vexing problems with this heat is that these um, thermal properties um, will also have an effect on the water flow. There's interesting feedbacks there. So water um, will flow from places um, in response to temperature gradients as well as in response to other things. And also, as I mentioned, the heat can affect the mechanical properties, possibly altering the fracture structure. Um, and if you have a site where um, the, it gets hot enough, you can actually boil the water and change it into a vapor phase. So this is um, a figure that just shows one particular scenario that was calculated for Yucca Mountain, showing some of these complex feedbacks between temperature and, and water flow in the vicinity of the repository. OK, so those, those are some of the natural prop properties of rocks. We also need to worry about what kinds of natural and human disturbances um, might um, impinge on the integrity of a repository. So one kind of natural disturbance are faults in the associated earthquakes. And we have to worry not only about fault movement within a repository that might fracture the canisters, but we also have to worry about what are the effects of shaking from movement along a distant fault in the repository on the repository tunnels, on the waste forms, etc. Another natural disturbance um, is volcanic activity, and this is um, clearly sort of a worst case scenario of a volcano erupting directly through the repository. Um, but as in the case of, of earthquakes and faults, we need to worry not only about this sort of worst case scenario, but we also need to worry about the associated heat and earthquake activity that accompanies um, volcanic eruptions, even if the volcano is at some distance from a, from a repository. Um, climate change can increase or decrease the amount of water that enters the subsurface by, via snow melt or rain infiltration. And it can also affect sea levels and the extent of ice sheets. And all of those can affect the directions and the magnitudes of subsurface water flow, um, both through the repository and from the repository to the land surface. So we need to be able to at least place some bounds on the impacts of climate change 
again, over very long periods of time. Um, and the Swedes, for example, are putting considerable effort into um, assessing what might happen at their proposed repository site if the Earth went into another ice age and glaciers advanced over the, um, the um, over Scandinavia. Um, a couple of other things we might worry about. Um, extreme erosion um, could unearth a repository that we thought was buried. Um, and extreme flooding um, might again change the amount of water infiltration and could certainly affect operations. But probably the most difficult di disturbance to assess um, are activities of humans, um, both now and in the far future. And um, we could certainly try to avoid sites where we know that there are resources that people want to go after right now. But we can't necessarily anticipate where future currently unrecognized resources might be. And um, if one thing that we've learned in the recent boom of um, fracking for natural gas <coughs> development is that um, resources may suddenly become available in places that we previously thought were undrillable or uneconomical. Um, and then finally, a few constructional and operational um, factors. The mechanical properties of rocks, again, affect the ease of construction. Um, they affect the cost of construction, affect the ability that we have to actually seal off tunnels and shafts um, after a repository is filled with the waste. And the excavation um, itself does um, changes the rock properties, could increase fracturing, could increase the permeability, and enhance water flow um, around there. And um, a few other things that we need to consider during operational periods are availability of water just for the construction and, and operations, and surface hazards like flooding and tsunamis and landslides. So the bottom line is I, I hope that I've convinced you that geology is essential to the sound management of radioactive waste and spent nuclear fuel.